Hi, welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case. Welcome if you're currently here in the live chat. As we do go along, feel free to share your thoughts, opinions on what we're talking about today and a range of other things too in between. If you haven't already, make sure to watch my previous video after watching this. I'll provide a link down below in the pinned comment section. It's important humans watch that video as it's to do with regarding the current state and what can happen down the line in the Dylan Rounds case, more so the community, because there are shifts and changes with time and not all for the good reasons. And other times where it appears positive, it will end negative. The video last night explains it and the situation, how it could come towards me, trouble, okay? It's all under control, make sure to check that out afterwards. Today, what we're going to be taking a look at is a new map analysis depicting the story told by the campers, the witnesses, on the 27th of May at night when they saw Dylan's farm in action, in use. I've mapped it out, we got the beacon points, the pinpoints, the times, you know, the time stamps. We're going to take a look at it. We're going to talk it through, explain the situation, what actually happened, okay, and what could have happened. And questioning other things such as, did they see anything else? What about that factor and that factor, okay? And maybe the possibility of other people within the area at the time as well, as mentioned by Black Dove and some others here and there, okay? So there's a, some interesting stuff we're going to be looking at today, so hopefully people are focused. In addition, we're, we'll probably do this one first just to allow people to all come on in so everyone's ready. First of all today we're going to take a look at the Find Dylan Rounds Facebook page as there are two interesting posts, one by Doug, the other one by someone else, but the responses are interesting because they're not direct responses, okay? So it makes you think a little bit, okay? In addition, you see that in the background, that is the belt. Sure, people could be whipped left, right and centre, but when we get to certain points or the way some people behave at times, they don't even deserve to be whipped, okay? What do they deserve? Not much. Just to be observed for a certain amount of time, look up, look down. What are they? Who are they? what's going on in here, etc. And then once that little watch time, the, the timeout has been issued, not literally, just observational, then maybe they can be whipped once again, right? So we've got different tiers as we go on, okay? But less of that, let's, uh, was there anything else to highlight? Oh yeah, Bob Farrell. Bob Farrell was present last night, but he wasn't able to communicate in the chat because he kept getting kicked off. Now that's um, unfortunate for Bob. I don't know why that happened. I didn't do anything. Um, I know there was the odd other person in recent time that had issues trying to connect with the live video premiere, unable to they kept getting booted or kicked off. It might have been Tom, Tom Evans himself, and maybe someone else at some point, but they got it resolved. I don't know if Bob has. Bob, let me know if it does get fixed and uh, feel free to share your thoughts in the live chat, okay? We st as said, we're starting to see um, a range of people coming on in, well-known individuals, right, within the case community. I've also noticed a slight influx or wave of new people but not new to the case and it's like oh where did they come from but arguably they've probably been in the background for some time right and they've just popped in here and there because you never know who is watching such as right now you know what i'm saying but okay i think what we should focus on today more specifically is dylan rounds the case and trying to understand where things are at. Because like how Tom said, we need to look back, but also it's important to try and understand what happened on the, the likes of the 27th. And this is yet another portion section which can depict what supposedly went down that day, or more so in this video, that night. You know what I'm saying? So, first of all, let's get into that Facebook post 
read it, analyze it, understand it, and then move forth there. So here we are with the first one, and this was posted 9th of February, so fairly recent, by mm, No Thanks Investigates. So what we saw last time, it was by Doug Hutton himself, and this time it's by the channel of Doug Hutton named mm, No Thanks, which is interesting. I mean, why use different accounts? I'm not quite sure there. But um, I think this is to do with in reference to that five hour live stream which went on recently. Okay, I know some of you are already familiar with it. Um, I might watch a bit of it at some point, but one individual like Tom said he listened to it and it didn't really get anywhere. It wasn't that useful. So it's like, you know, do you want to sit there for five hours and then find out, oh, that's it. It's it's kind of risky, you know what I'm saying, time efficiency wise. But let's just read this post anyway, which I guess was talking about it in general. Um, no thanks says, today we start making this brand and family stronger. Wait, hold on. First of all, is it appropriate to be using the word brand and family in the same sentence? All I'm saying is, you know how Candice Cooley is. She doesn't like people making money off this or that or introducing a clothing line, you know, in the name of Dylan or growing because of Dylan and then making the most of it and exploiting it in a unnatural ways. Maybe it's not meant like it here, but the word brand, normally when you've got a brand like a clothing brand, some kind of business, established, developed, popular, make money. You know, you know when you interpret just that one word, it just seems a little bit, uh, is that the correct wording? What does Candice Cooley think of it, or does she just brush over it? Let me know your thoughts. It was just a little observation that. Uh, um, no thanks says, I'm truly humbled for the people who truly care about the missing and exploited and came together five hours strong with us for Dylan Rounds and his family yesterday. Big thanks to Salty Pancakes in brackets, Mike and the free family. Okay, you'll be seeing more posts and activity here on this account, so please share it out. Love y'all. Road to 100k subscribers. Oh, once again, is that appropriate? Using the hashtag road to 100k subscribers when Candice Cooley criticised other YouTubers and maybe Doug did at times towards other channels where they were covering the case just so they get views, just so their channel grows and becomes more popular. You know, it's like self-advertisement, this, directly on the Dylan Rounds Facebook page. Is it appropriate? You know what I'm saying? And I know some people can say, so what, who cares? It's just covering the case. That's all that matters, keeping it alive. Yes, but if you've got certain individuals that call out others uh, for some actions or the way they say things, the way they cover it, and it just so happens to be mirrored here, technically, it's kind of like two-faced, a bit hypocritical, right? And as well, if Candy's Cooley doesn't approve of YouTubers that do it to grow their channel, would she approve of this post with that hashtag and the word brand, growing, improving? I, um, I don't know. Maybe people don't look too close at those words, but they do stand out, right? Let's just clear that. What do the comments say? Oh, wait, and there's... Oh, my God. I've just realised. And there's even a photo there. Um, no thanks. And it's even got a QR code for PayPal. Literally fitting all forms of advertisement into one, into this post. The overall message is, hey, thanks everyone that, you know, joined and did this video and watched along to spread awareness of Dylan Rounds. But secretly, you know, here's my little photo of the PayPal QR code if you uh, wish to uh, scan it with your phone or whatever and you know we've got it we've got the hashtag grow to 100k subscribers because you know we're really close so you know just subscribe and then it will help the channel grow right these little prompts which subconsciously might tap into people's mindsets right all these little methods used in life right to attract people to 
get this, get that. And it's like, it's all been implemented here, but on a very covert scale. Interesting. Does anyone else see what I'm talking about right now? Say yes, if you do down below. Hmm, interesting. Let's just check the comments quickly. Oh man, I can't believe I missed it. No thanks. It was a doozy. I don't know what doozy means. I, I assume that's more dodgy American slang. Tony says, yeah, I'm two hours in. I'm glad the puzzle pieces are finally falling into place. I saw through JT from the beginning and I have him blocked for bullying me for having a chronic illness and a high risk pregnancy. Oh. But love you and crime and justice from the beginning. Okay. Cutcler Black Snake says my connection began on YouTube, but I only get notifications from this group. I don't care for any of the others. I was sorely aggrieved by them all. Being notified by Candice and Justin is all I can handle. All the others can E S A D. Don't know what that means. V M D A K Cutcler. Is that code word? I don't know. Brentlin says any of them are bad news. They fake fight to increase clicks. I mean, just as a little observation on the spot, have I ever really seen it as fake fighting? No, I've just seen it as people being a bit petty and going after one another, grudges just continuously forming and going around in a repetitive circle, but I would understand it more if it was fake fighting. Make it seem as serious as possible, as realistic, so it stirs up attention, intrigue, entertainment, and all of that. And it would kind of make sense, considering how all these people, uh, at some points, all are suddenly friendly after calling one another behind each other's backs. And they would have heard about it when they've checked each other's videos out whilst they've been hiding and lurking in the background. And the next thing you know, they appear in a live stream together, whether it be a group or multiple, and it's like, hey, hey, everyone, hi, yeah, yeah, it's great to meet you. And then after it, it's like, oh, my God, you're such a dickhead, you're such a slut, fucking little whore, oh, my God, petty-ass bitch. I'm going to knock those freckles right out of your fucking face, boy. Prison time for you. And the next thing you know, it's, hey, 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 sweetie. Oh, my God, honey, how y'all doing? What, you do your thing, preach girl. It's like, what? Hmm. I mean, it has existed on YouTube before, fake fighting, and it has been exposed with time. Are we seeing that right now? We can do a poll right now. So whilst, yes, there is unnecessary drama and tension within this case, which can cause many problems, do you think it's fake fighting, or do you think it's genuine, like, deep-rooted, heated tension, etc.? Make sure to vote right now, because it'd be interesting to see what other people think. What else? Cutler agreed, in brackets, not apply on words, however seemed fighting after wrote agreed. I don't understand what she said then. Uh, Francis, oh gosh, I missed this because I never saw it. Well, that's normally what happens if you don't see something. Maybe I can find it on the other site. I know this page is monitored, but is this Candice and Justin approved? Well, you'd, you'd assume so, right? But maybe Angela is questioning it as well because of how Doug posted it and advertised it, maybe. I'm not quite sure. Um, leave your thoughts, fam. So that was the first one, right? And, of course, like, from what some people have said when they did watch it, they didn't see it of much interest. And this whole arrest thing, people are going to be arrested. People in Montello, oh, people are getting scared and rattled all of a sudden. And then others are saying, no, no, it's just exaggerated. Just a scare tactic to put fear into people. Maybe it is some kind of psychological trick to get people to confess indirectly. Maybe. Kind of like how if you came across someone and you had no clue what they've done, but you said to them, I know what you've been up to. They even try to hide it. I know exactly. And then they're like, oh, well, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean for that to happen. And then you respond back saying, oh, no, I wasn't thinking of that. But, oh, wow. So you have done that. You know, it, it can happen. But look, this is the thing. And I'll just base it off from past experience. There was a time in the past where Doug from No Thanks did a community post 
And it was like the mid days of the Dylan Rounds case talking about a police presence in Montello. And Doug was saying, yeah, the whole of Montello has been cornered off. A massive police presence and police cars are all down there locking the place down. And people getting arrested left, right and centre, man. And then we found out in the end, it was like two officers... Uh, another police guy, one car, they went down to the post office asking about uh, where a certain individual or two was to kick the door in and then arrest him and that was it. So it really was underwhelming and had nothing to do with the Dylan Rounds case but Doug made it seem like it was related to the Dylan Rounds case. So are we seeing that again? You never know. You think of these, I don't know if you call them scare tactics but you know, Whilst I have had resistance from some dark forces out there, if you want to call it that, the likes of Doug, when calling out those dark forces, Doug may have used scare tactics there as well, saying you're going to get sued, you're going to get arrested, you're going to be knocked off this, you're going to be plastered all over the place and revealed for who you really are, you, you're, you're going to be publicly revealed and shamed as a con man, etc, etc. And it's like all these like methods... And as the dark forces have responded, well, I'm still here, the channel's still up, you know, people said they were going to take me down, and yet, you know, I'm still present. I mean, yeah, for now, you never know what happens in the future, but you see that concept of a lot of words, but where's the actual action, right? I think, whether it be in the Dylan Rounds case directly, or to do with maybe things going on in the community, there's probably action underway, but maybe it's just at a slower rate. You never know. Of course, things will eventually tell. Will it be too late by then? With certain things now, no, some stuff will age well, I think. Can't be said about Bella Vivo. Whew, no, 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 no. But Let's just put all that aside and move on to the next post. If it wants to load up, get off. Okay. So this is by Chris and Alexis Schaefer, 8th of February. Okay, day before. And he says, has there been any leads at all on this case? Anything else going on? And let's see what's been said. Jazz Grolson says... There is a person of interest in custody on federal weapon charges. At this point, we just wait for police and prosecutors to do their work and pray for justice for Dylan. Does anyone find that weird how Jazz Girlson worded it? There is a person of interest in custody. Who? Now... This is the thing. I know some people could be like, well, Brenner, duh. Brenner's the one who's uh, been arrested. Uh, Brenner's the one who's been done for the gun charges. But let's just remember one thing. It was supposedly on one gun charge, how it's been worded at one point. Then it went back to gun charges. So we're getting a bit of misinformation there with time. But let's just put that aside in addition. What we also need to remember is... There is another guy out there elsewhere, but also done for gun charges in custody, and that's Chase Venstra. And from the looks of it, Chase Venstra's name has been cleared. Candice Cooley believes he's innocent. But, you know, the way this description is worded, it, it seems like it applies to Chase Venstra as well, either Brenner or Venstra. As for Don Haitley, even if he is responsible, he's not in custody right now, as of from what I know of, and he's not been done for any gun charges. So, does anyone know why Jazz Girlson has worded it so vague? Like, if we read this many months ago, way back at the start of this case, you'd be like, Ah, person of interest. Mm, yeah, because that's how it was worded back then. Um, back then, when they were talking about Don Haley, they actually referred to him as a friend of the suspect. A friend of Brenner, which was Don Haley. And then it evolved from being known as a friend to Don H. And then, I guess, more recent time, Don Haley, right? There's been a procedure. Certain names held back 
maybe for privacy reasons, maybe for legal reasons because of the case. And then with time, with news reports, it started opening up. So why are we going backwards all of a sudden with this formal, vague language? It implies we're talking about a completely different person all of a sudden. I feel that it could still be referring to Brenner, but it's a poor choice of wording. You know what I'm saying? Chris says, hoping for the best. Um, if I could, I'd be there searching. Jazz says, we all would. The family feels our support knows we're not alone. Right, is that it? Um, very little searching it takes. One have cover. Okay. Stay warm. Sonia Mason says, there is supposed to be an announcement from Dylan's mom sometime this month. Yep. Justice we're done. So it's pretty simple, this post, but it's just that response by Jazz Girlson, which kind of confused me a little bit. Let me know your thoughts on this post. You know, what do you think? Who do you think is she referring to? Brenner or maybe someone else out there? Okay. So now we move on to the campus, the witnesses that saw Dylan out there the 27th of May, Friday night. And before we go on to the maps to visualise and tell the story, I just wanted to read this little e extract, which some of you would have heard from one of my previous videos, but not been able to read the text as clearly. So hopefully this up close, it's a little bit easier to read. Uh, I've, I've cropped it down because some of the other text wasn't as relevant. So I'll just briefly read this now, just so you're up to date with things and it rejogs your memory and then we can transition onto the maps. It says, in mid-December, we returned to Little Pigeon Mountain to camp overnight in 2022. We hadn't returned there since May the 27th and June the 4th and the 5th of last year, 2022, the night before Dylan went missing and your first big search for him the following weekend. We had quickly realised then that returning to Little Pigeon would never feel the same to us. This time, we threw out our tent near where we camped the night of May 27th, and again could see Dylan's farm. We vividly recalled seeing the tractor working the land as we approached the mountain that evening, and the bright lights of someone on the farm well after dark. And we recalled the hellacious rains that drove in the early morning of the 28th, we pondered the unimaginable turn of events that must have taken place within a matter of hours last May. We're reminded about our going back out to help search for a missing young man a week later, whom we didn't know but who shared a love of an area we found special to us. Okay. Let's now head on to the maps to depict it and show the location of where these campers were at. So here we are, as you can see on the screen, not too busy or congested this time. Bit of a simple format and structure, as well as colour-coded. The only thing you don't really need to focus on too much is the bright red beacon with the star saying Don H. That was to do with a previous project. But all the other markers are relevant to what we're going to be talking about today, okay? Have we specifically colour-coded it? Well, I just wanted to do different colours for different locations or events, okay, or objects present. As for this black marker down here with the lines spreading off like a V, that's just to present the possible field of view the campers had when on top or nearby of Little Pigeon Mountain where they camped out. Obviously, there is still some unanswered questions, but... From the looks of it, the facts are the witnesses saw someone at Dylan's farm operating the tractor. And of course, I know people can say, are we sure it's Dylan? It could be someone else. My only question would be, who else would it be and why? Who else could be bothered to do farm work that late at night? Not many. Probably only Dylan because of his mindset, how he works, his attitude, his work ethic. 
And if it's not because of that, then the only other reason that's left on the table is someone trying to, to maybe dispose of Dylan and covering up the ground in the process, making it seem like farm-related work, maybe. That's the only other possibility. But we don't need to skip too far ahead. What we need to do is just really zone in and slow down, right? So envision this. It's May 27th, 2022. Dylan has come back from Montello on that day. I guess later on, Friday. Coming back, driving past sun tunnels and eventually reaching his farm. At that point, what does he immediately do? Does Dylan go into his trailer to sit down, get food, relax? Or did he immediately go into his tractor to begin work? That's somewhat unknown of. Whilst there are witnesses present to say they saw activity at the farm at a certain time, no one really witnessed Dylan passing by, reaching his farm. What makes me think is that the campers were hiking in the area and it took them time to get to Little Pigeon Mountain, which is back here. If we zoom in, you see Little Pigeon Mountains. And I think that applies to this whole area, this like radius, if you want to call it that. So how far back are we situated? Down here or closer up here? It's got to be somewhere nearby for it to be in in line of sight with the farm, okay? Because if you're down here, you might have your view obstructed. Let me flip the image, such as that. Those little mountains do kind of get in the way. So you'd think you'd either have to be in front, lower down to see ahead, or maybe on top. And it is a possibility that they may have been on top because it's not a massive mountain, is it? it? It should be somewhat easy to get up to, to be on a bit of a peak, a bit of a point, to get a good view of your surrounding and to be able to camp out in this one spot. Kenny Veach did it with Sheep Peak, Gas Peak in the Mojave Desert and was somewhat successful. So the same could have happened here, right? Where did they come from? That's another question which hasn't been answered, right? I don't know where where they parked. I mean, is there a, a very small possibility that what Black Dove said about possible campers being in this area here, whether it be right next to the sun tunnels or just somewhat nearby, could it have been the same people that parked up here because it's away from the road and then they walked south or they walked somewhat southeast down this way I mean, there is a bit of mileage to cover on foot, but coming all the way down to round this area to get to sheep, uh, Little Pigeon Mountains, is that a possibility? That's what we need to try and understand, these campers. Where was their starting point? Did they leave their vehicles behind and then go on a hike? That's a possibility. Like... Maybe people who are a bit more familiar with the area probably know the, the likely route these campers came from, right? The the back roads, the roads which are accessible and public. Because you know there might be the odd road which is restricted, right? And you won't be able to go down. So if you've got an idea, feel free to list it down below in the comments of which way they came into the place. And I guess, is it reasonable to ask the question, why were these people present? Why? I mean, okay, loosen to go on a walk, to be in nature, but is it really the type of appealing place people go to? What's your thoughts about that? Considering it's a ghost town, right? What about all the nature walks and the, the nice scenery? I mean, that can apply to an extent, but doesn't it seem quite vast, open and a bit empty, right? It's, I don't know doesn't seem like a, a tourist attraction place. But then again, depending who these people were, maybe they like this type of area. They like it where it's quiet, peaceful, away from everyone. That might benefit them. That's what attracts them to this area, right? In a recent time, we did go through a little bit of confusion 
by some stating these campers were homestead people, i.e. like living there for some time. And it's like, oh, so are they not campers? Are they just people that live in the area that live in camper vans or RV trailers? It's kind of going back and forth, but the way it's been worded once again in the letter, the official letter by the people that were there at the time, they were going out there to hike and to camp overnight. So that's what their intention was. They weren't permanently living there, okay? Because if they were permanently living there, I'm sure they would have seen a lot more develop, right, with time of stuff going on. Like, you envision this. If these campers were present, right, over here, they would have seen the following events with, like, the gun and key fob, right? But it doesn't seem like that's the case because they left long before then, right? Okay? So whichever way they came from, whether it be west or east or maybe somewhat south, it wouldn't surprise me if it may have been south because if you think about it, you got that road, down here, which is um, in parallel to that dried up lake. And if you keep on going all the way down there, you eventually get onto the highway, which then connects onto um, um, Wendover, right? There you go, Wendover down here. For that road, come round here, you're on the highway, there we go, the 93 highway. You look back up there, that's the way you've come down from. And then you go into Wendover, and if not that, you keep on going. All the way up there, you eventually get into Salt Lake City. So maybe that's where those campers were originally from, where they live. And they came down here just for a bit of peace and quiet possibility. I just wanted to cover the possible routes they came from to begin with, right? So... Maybe the driving up this way, a bit of a road trip. Apologies if the image quality doesn't quite process as fast this time. It's just not performing to this, my standards. Getting to this point here, maybe drive up there or maybe turn off if there's possible alt routes, right? Does it turn off to the right? Mm, I mean, there is like a little road there, but I think that's more of like a wash interesting like what is that black line there what is that does anyone know drop the coordinates just quickly i think i did come across this in a past video but i don't think i don't know what the answer was or if people had one at the time but just a bit weird how it stands out it does appear to be um some kind of dirt red nevertheless you can get over that way and as for the sun tunnels, that is accessible to general public, hence why you've seen different photos of people visiting there with time, right? Sun tunnels being down here. This green marker is what I highlighted by supposedly Black Dove's point about the possibility there was other high, uh, there was people camping near to sun tunnels, right? Has sun tunnels ever come up before in discussion? Yeah, something to do with Chase Venstra on a quad bike within the area, driving around for whatever reason, okay? Any, any other events? Not that I know of. But if any of you have heard of any other events which have taken place near to the sun tunnels, whatever it may be, feel free to list it down below. It could be of some interest, right? I mean, it kind of bridges the gap in between the uh, grain shed, which is just up that way, you see that marker, and Dylan's farm, which is down there, so it's kind of in the middle of both, and if you're nearby to the sun tunnels, you will see what comes and goes, right, which drives up to the grain shed and leaves the same way, maybe, which comes from Dylan's farm and goes back in that direction as well, right, so like, you'd be able to get a good range, a good view of possible action and activity going on, okay? So, with that somewhat cleared up, we work our way back down here, right? We apply it to Dylan Rounds, okay? Friday night, Dylan gets back 
What's the weather like? Who knows? It's pop. It's done. No one said it's rained, right? But if Dylan's aware ahead of time that it's going to be raining the next day, that could be a possibility, an encouragement, an incentive to think, right, I need to get on with my farm work right now, you know, racing against time. Sure, I could do it tomorrow morning, but do I really want to? No, because I've only got a small bit more to do and the remainders can be done in the future. I mean, in Dylan's mindset, it probably would have been, got a bit of a deadline. Um, the following day, I just want to be able to like wrap things up, move on, go elsewhere, maybe visit family. I don't want to start being tied up with more work the following day when I'm supposed to be leaving the place, right? So he just wanted to get some additional work in. I know Indiana did mention the counterpoints of why would Dylan need to do that if he's already done some seeding beforehand and arguably it wasn't done to the best of his ability or it wasn't the greatest of jobs. Mm, I mean, if Dylan's got a little bit of additional land, aside from the pivot, he can like plant some stuff in. Maybe that's um, another possibility, right? So although we don't have the equipment on site right now to depict it, but just imagine Dylan's trailer parts in this area as well as the grain truck as we just left the marker there right parts up is it being used directly at this moment in time um maybe it might have been emptied a little bit if dylan's doing some seeding i mean he's using another vehicle the tractor to get on with stuff um does anyone know how it works does the tractor uh, drag a trailer behind which sp like sprays out the seed from different angles is is that how it works or it drops from underneath the trailer as it's embedded into the ground each seed something like that whatever the case during that process of when it's underway that's when over the, that way south in that direction the campers get to Little P Pigeon Mountain and then that's when they can see all the way from down there to here and witness the tractor being used and the glowing lights. I mean, if they were on top of that mountain, they've got an vantage point they can look down and because there's no obstructions ahead, there's no trees, no buildings, you know, they can clearly see what's going on. Did they you know, observe it for as long as possible. But that seems to be the case. I don't know if I mentioned it here. Um, yeah. So I just put the marker tractor here, and because um, it wasn't um, cluttered up with these two other markers, right? Red marker, 27th tractor in use, spotted by the witnesses over there, right? We'll do that in a second. And they said the tractor was used, the farm work took place between 11.30 to 11.45 p.m., right? So a short space of time. But, you know, if it's late at night, Dylan may be getting a bit fatigued and tired. You can only do so much, you know. That's probably why it's short. Or maybe he was just able to get it done very quickly because he was being efficient, he had the correct equipment, he was focused and organised, whichever, it was done, but it was a short space of time. So you could say it's easily excused by the fact that maybe if it wasn't Dylan, it could have been someone disposing of Dylan in a short space of time in that ground. That's if you think along a different line, okay? But I'm not going too deep into that right now. What happens after this? Or you'd assume Dylan parks his tractor up, um, goes into his trailer and then sleeps. Then wakes up the next morning, the 28th, when he goes missing later on in the day. You'd think that, right? Do we need to give the point of view from down there? Not quite yet. Because the next point, what we need to take a look at, speaking of timing from this to that, from how it was worded, on that forum page, what we've been looking at with time, not the Dylan Rounds Facebook page, but that other forum page you've seen me read from, like when you had Grandma Bear, uh, you had She Who Must Not Be Named, those people, you remember those usernames? Well, I guess in recent time, when we were reading through one of the pages, 
can't remember which one it was, they were actually talking about the weather. Was it raining? Yes, no. And people said, well, from what I've recently seen from such and such a video, it did talk about it raining. And from my knowledge of what I found about when researching, it rained between 5 to 6 a.m. in the morning. And I guess it can be further reinforced by the fact that, that the campers, the witnesses that were present on the 27th, following into the 28th, as they were there to see it, they said it was raining hellaciously. Hellacious rain, right? That's quite strong wording. I guess hellacious is hell, great, a lot, heavy downpour, right? Why is that significant? Well, for some time, I was under the impression that it rained on Sunday, the day after. Candice Cooley said that herself, right? She has said that previously. It rained on a Sunday, and that's why she couldn't understand why there were no footprints out there. Because when uh, Karen, Dylan's grandmother, phoned Don or Brenna, whichever way around it was, for them to, to go out and search, when Candice Cooley went afterwards on the, the 30th when they came down, they noticed there was no footprints, which suggested that no one went out looking, searching for Dylan. And that turned out to be the case, right? So that's why it was focused on the 28th in terms of rain. But the way it's been worded in most recent time by the actual witnesses who were there in the area, they said it was raining on the Saturday in the early hours of the morning. And from how it was described, hellacious rain sounds pretty extreme, right? And the reason, in addition to why that's so important, is because what time did Dylan wake up? That's what you got to ask yourself. You know, after 11.45pm the night before, I guess Dylan went on to sleep for whatever time he had left. Did he get enough sleep? maybe to an extent, but he would have, would he have woken up to the rain? Yes, no. Well, what we need to do is just briefly skip ahead to the next time stamp to put things into perspective, okay? So, if we just zoom out and fast forward to Dylan wakes up, gets into the grain truck here to then drive down that blue lit road, right? All the way down reach in near to sun tunnels, then turning right to go up to the grain shed, which is here, as you see, right? But encountering the obstacle of the, uh, the gate to the grain shed being locked, okay? You remember that timestamp when Dylan got his phone out, made the call to the grandmother and said, hey, you know, I got to park my grain truck in the grain shed. I'll respond back to you afterwards. Bye. That was at 6.51 a.m. So, how long did it take from Dylan to wake up, to come down to here and make that call? Did it take Dylan around 50 minutes to get from his farm up to this point? Did he wake up quick? Was he in a rush? Was he relaxed? You know what I'm saying? Because if you think about it, if it was between 5 a.m. to 6 a.m., you know, 6 o'clock, when it was raining heavy, was Dylan asleep during that period? Because I don't think it would have taken an hour to get from the farm down to here, right? So he must have woke up late. I'd say maybe Dylan woke up maybe at 6.30 maybe, 6.25, pushing it 6.40, and then drove down 10 minutes to get to here, possibly, you know, because you've got to take in mind, you wake up, you come out of the trailer, maybe you've got to just do some little adjustments on the farm, just head over, actually, do you know what, we'll literally tell the story now, let's say Dylan wakes up, right, about 6.20, 6.30, gets out of his trailer, checks the grain truck to see how it is, maybe goes over to check the field nearby, check the pivot, wherever that 
direction it is in just to see how the seeds are doing right and eventually getting into the grain truck and then driving down but would dylan have known it rained yes or no because if you think heavy rainfall it can be noisy you can hear it right even when you're in a normal house it's loud when it's bashing against the windows so if you're in some kind of trailer rv and it's hitting the rooftop that could wake you up what i'm trying to understand is if Dylan's main objective on the 28th was to park the grain truck in the grain shed before it rains, then what was the actual point? Because from how it's worded by the witnesses who were there at the time, it was raining way before Dylan even woke up to park the grain truck in the grain shed. So wouldn't the seed have already been ruined even before he managed to get the truck down to the place? You go, I'm saying... Now, Kurt Wadsworth did say that the grain truck has like a sheeting that goes over it, but there are holes in it. But regardless of that, regardless of that little coverage, that little protection thing, if it's raining heavy, it's going to ruin the seeds, right? So what happened? That's the big question. What happened between five to six o'clock in the morning? Was Dylan awake did Dylan do anything or was he fast asleep from five to six? And then after six, when the rain stopped, is that when Dylan woke up? Did he even realise it's it's been raining? Did he even notice it? I don't know, right? You think about it. When he made that call to the grandmother and he was saying what he needs to do, that's what I was saying. Did he appear stressed or worried? Because if it's already rained, wouldn't have Dylan made, uh, made that known on the call saying, you know, I'm going to park the grain truck in the grain shed, but it's already been raining, so my seeds are already wet. You know, what am, I, what am I going to do? You get what I'm saying? That's what I just can't understand. If it's already been raining, isn't it too late to park the truck undercover? That's what I'm trying to understand. And even if Dylan did wake up even earlier, in between five to six, then what the hell was he doing all that time in between, right? Why did it take over an hour? Well, nearly an hour then. Is it because there was so much trouble with the gate? But then, as for the gate itself, from what Ellen Berg has said, and I've seen the gate visually, I have covered it in a past video of mine, so make sure to check it out. This gate is small and fairly weak and unstable. So, whilst it's successful at keeping the horse in, you could possibly climb over the fence, you could like push it down slightly with your hand, climb over and maybe unlock it in some way, or maybe flatten the gate literally, right? If that was the case, then maybe it would have angered Brenner that there was damage caused to that fence. The reason and purpose of that fence is to keep the horse in. And if you damage that fence, you could get a repeat of the past. And Candice Cully did state that in the past, when that happened and the horse escaped, Brenner was angry, right? So, if Brenner's horse is harmed in any way or goes missing, that can trigger Brenner. Could that have been the direct cause for Brenner's enragement this time? Possibly to an extent. Maybe Brenner got angry due to the possibility of what could happen out of that event. But it didn't, but it could have, right? But we don't need to go any further than that in this timeline because we're focusing specifically on the 27th following into the morning of the 28th, right? But you get the idea of the time zones from 5 to 6 o'clock in the morning up to 6.51 a.m. on the 28th of May, right? Now, let's just really focus in uh, from the point of view, the field of view, right, of the campers. They said they camped nearby to where they camped the original time. So when they revisited, just a separate mark here, June 4th and 5th, to go back, I guess this was to help in assistance for trying to search for Dylan, right? June the 4th and 5th. Now, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. 
Was it June the 4th slash 5th when the gun and key fob was returned one day following the other? Am I correct in saying that? I know June the 2nd was the spring cleaning, as worded by Candice Cooley when Brenner at the grain shed took garbage out, trash bags, and disposed of them later. But was it June the 4th and 5th when the gun and key fob was returned? I'm just saying, because if it was, and these campers went back out on that day, is it a little bit coincidental, the timing? Would they have seen anything if they were out there? If they went, if they went back out there, um, how long was it for? The whole day? Did they stop there the night? Not quite sure. From how it was worded in that letter, when they went the 27th of May, they stopped there overnight, camped out. And then the next time they went back to that same spot to camp out was December of 2022, right? Months on. So I guess maybe the 4th and 5th of June, they did revisit, but they didn't camp there. So I guess if that's the case, then they wouldn't have seen the activity at night time when the gun and key fob was returned on the different days. Mm. That is unfortunate, that. Because, damn, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, if these campers were back on this mountain area, wherever that may be, up here, further back, they may have seen lights on at the farm during the night once again, just like how they witnessed it um, several days before that, earlier on, when it came to Dylan. It would have been almost like a little repeat. And having that validation by witnesses, it could have helped. I mean... Mm, would it have truly helped? You know, if you don't have cameras up close and you just have people nearby observing in the distance, they might be able to see someone there, but they might not be able to see exactly who, the, the face of the person, the identity. And that's the most important thing, right? I guess the only other important piece, if you was able to look out for it, would be the truck, the vehicle of the person, what they're driving. You're able to look at the license plate on the back on the front maybe you could do a, a search online and then see who the owner is that would be the other possibility but unfortunately from the looks of it there was no witnesses on those days the, the nights following when the gun and key fob was returned which is unfortunate i know some out there wished that there was cameras put out there but uh yeah i mean all I'll say is, and, you know, if you've got an explanation, you can say it yourself, but like how that that guy out there who said, you know, you, you got to, you should have had cameras put out there in this specific area. And they said it was going to happen, you know, I told you, you should have put it out there. How did he know that the gun and key fob was going to be returned back? How would he know? You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Like, you'd, you'd think cameras at the grain shed, yeah, scene of the crime, but the farm. The only thing I can think of is, the only reason why they said it was because it's two key locations, it's in the middle of nowhere, you've got no other forms of surveillance camera systems, so put your own ones out there and you never know what you may find. But it's also like, how long are you supposed to have those cameras out there for? And how long do you anticipate for a result to come from it? It's as if the person was ahead of time. They could see into the future. And not that I'm saying or suggesting anything, but normally if you can predict the future, then maybe it's because you have control of what happens next. That is a little bit dodgy and deep. Mm. Let's not go too far with that. Yeah, let me know your thoughts about this visual layout, okay? So, as for the hikers, campers themselves, on this bumpy, somewhat uneven ground, yeah, you got good views all around. And it would make sense, the driving force to why you would go to Little Pigeon Mountain, because it's somewhat accessible, and then you can appreciate the surrounding even better than being on flat ground. 
So maybe they did work their way up because you, it's not exactly a tra- uh, a pa- uh, a path or a trail. It's probably a bit of like like a wash, a spring, but you follow it up here, right? The gradient is it doable? I would say so compared to some of the hikes what we've looked at previously in the past. Yeah, doable. Maybe there's a specific route to go up where it's a bit safer and more, uh, where it's more forgiving. I mean, look at that there. You could follow that, like, wash, spring up, up to the top, up here, right? Camping here, maybe. Possibly, if you can see into the distance, if you get the angle correct, such as, where's the highest point? Probably here. From the looks of it, this is like the highest point where you can see all the way around. And in the distance, looking down that, if you call it valley, ahead in the distance, you might be able to just about see the lights on, right? Did they get closer? Makes you think. Right. If they saw it from a bit of a distance, because they did say as they were approaching the mountains, that's when they saw the tractor being in use. So maybe it was a bit alluring to them that it, entice them to just walk down this mountain like you know like how it goes up and down at this point could you have seen yes at this point you can definitely overlook the mountains lower down and see ahead where the farm is there is a clearance so you could definitely see it from round this area here and i'll put the marker what i'm talking about this point here if they camped out there they could definitely look in the distance looking north okay then it does kind of like come back down the gradient, drops down into this like section where you probably can't see as clearly, right? And it comes back down, goes lower, you know what I'm saying? You've come down from that way. So I, I don't know if they explored Little Pigeon Mountain, walked around it, or they just stopped in one area. As it comes down here, it does go up again in height, but it's a little bit more uneven. But you've got this section here, maybe you could camp on. And then you can definitely see over that way, observing whatever's going on. And we'll just stop at this point and carry on talking, right? Because what I want to say is, if these witnesses were able to see supposedly Dylan doing his work at night time and they themselves stopped there the night what time did they wake up you know they're camping in a tent and you've got heavy rainfall it'll probably wake you up right let me know in the chat if it's woken you up before if you've been camping okay did this is my question and it wasn't mentioned in that letter so you may assume that they didn't but did the campers, the witnesses, see Dylan leaving his farm on the 28th, heading to the grain shed in the grain truck? Yes or no? Did that ever truly happen? Because I just want to know, what is the time these witnesses woke up on the day and when did they leave to go back from wherever they came from? Did they leave on the Saturday or did they leave on the Sunday? Because if they were there for most part of Saturday as well, where did they go? Did they just stay here and camp and just walk about? Did they go down to the farm to inspect, to ask who the person was or whatever was going on? Or did they just mind their own business? Like... It just makes you think, you know, if you've actually got people here, and for the most part of it, it's normally a complete ghost town. This is the one opportunity you've got to see Dylan in action or getting ready for the day, maybe minutes or hours before disaster. But obviously these campers would never have known the following outcome. But from this distance, you would have been able to see, and that blue line is the road from Dylan's farm all the way down to Sun Tunnels, which then turns off to go to the grain shed. You would have been able to clearly see the grain truck leaving Dylan's property and going down to at least Sun Tunnels. You can clearly see the road from here. And of course, 
providing it's not too um like the vision isn't too obscured because of the heavy rain um you might be able to see a dust trail but this is the next point right would you have really seen a dust trail like wow this is actually this is opening up other poss possibilities now you may have not been able to see much of a dust trail because if it's already rained in the early hours of the morning from five to six, the ground's going to be wetter. So you're not going to get that dry dust forming in the atmosphere, are you? Maybe not. I guess it depends how heavy it rained and stuff and did it dry up quick, yes or no. But what this also opens up for um, debating is whether it be on the same day later on or the next day after, depending... Dylan's pickup truck, which supposedly another suspect, uh, these suspects or an additional suspect, if in question, used, got muddy, right? And the talk was, oh, the truck probably drove through a wash where it's wet. But it's like, well, if it's dry, the area and the washes dry up in dry, hot weather then how's it going to be any different from driving in that compared to driving on a normal dirt road? If it's dry, it's dry. You get what I'm saying? Unless it's a little bit damp, a little bit saturated, a little bit moist. But with now knowing from what the witnesses have said, right, that it was raining on the day, the ground would have been wetter. And if you're driving a vehicle through whatever terrain, it's probably going to splash mud up. It's going to get the vehicle dirty, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to go for a wash in order to get the truck dirty. You can just simply drive through uh, on normal ground and for the mud to splash up in the wheel well and area, right? And then as for the talk about, oh, but was it pressure washed, power washed later? Some say it was, others say no. It was probably natural rainfall that washed away some of the dirt on top because you still saw some marks on the truck afterwards. And the only reason why the wheel well part wasn't truly cleaned off the dirt was because when it rains, it rains down. It's not raining underneath the vehicle, is it? So you can't target those areas. You'd have to manually do it yourself, right? So maybe the reason why Dylan's truck got muddied and the reason why there was track marks in some areas was because it rained before the truck could be used to, to, I guess, dispose of Dylan. And that it stopped at a certain point, of course, in the day, early on. But then it rained once again the following day on Sunday. And that's what led to the vehicle, when previously returned back, maybe on a Saturday or on a Sunday. Then it rained, and then it washed away any excess dirt, which collected from the journey beforehand. You get what I'm saying? So... With knowing the weather, it doesn't mean that one had to go through a wash in order to get the vehicle dirty. Just simply driving down a road could have caused that, especially with the rain. So yeah, and as for that black line, what I've done, like a V, whether it be on this side, camping on the lower ground, or on the right-hand side, camping on the lower ground round here, you still would have seen the farm from that angle. And you would have seen the farm too from this angle here. Okay? And if you were on the mountain, you'd have to be at a certain point, a certain spot, the highest tip, which overlooks the lower mountains, like here, to be able to see directly head on at where Dylan's farm's at. Right? So hopefully that makes sense to you. The only other thing I want to highlight is because this pond was down here, which could be seen as a little bit of a, an, a tourist attraction. You know, if you're in the area, you're hiking about, you want to see, um, you want to explore, right? Whilst it could look all the same and very flat, if you come across just a pond, something simple like that, that could be interesting to you. It could intrigue you. You'd be like, oh, wow, we've actually got something different to look at. Did the campers ever come down to this spot to observe the pond? Because this is another angle where you could have seen Dylan's farm head on, right? And has this pond ever been talked about much in the past? Wasn't much ever going on here 
That's what I want to say. You know? Is there any significance, anything buried here, anything nearby? Leave your thoughts. Now, the reason why this area is also interesting, aside from the fact that there was campers here staying the night, this, or should I say, when turning around, this area back here where we've looked at is the same location Ty Corbin highlighted several times in past videos on other people's channels, saying this is one of a couple of locations that need to be checked out. Uh, what was the other ones? Ty Corbin was saying Governor's Spring, Bald Eagle Mountain on the other side, uh, Rosebud Wash, then another one, and then Little Pigeon Mountain, right? So did Ty Corbin know about these campers and witnesses out there? Does he know anything about it? Has he already gone down there or did he go down there earlier on in the case? I'm not too sure. It's just interesting how a place of interest that should be searched, suggested, is also the key place where these witnesses were at. And maybe to some people it's like, well, no shit. But at least from my point of view, from what I knew of in this case, I had no clue where these witnesses were at. Because from what I heard in the past was, it was worded as you had people camping out there, they saw Dylan's tractor, and it's like, yeah, but from what angle? Northeast, southwest? How close were they? Literally up close or really far away? And I guess we found our answer now. So, you know, if you've noticed anything or if you have any questions regarding this camping trip, the location, the angle, the scenery, uh, questions about how long were they there for, or if you can answer them, feel free to. But I just wanted to map it out to you so you could kind of, like infer what was going through the campers' minds and what they could see at the time from where they were at. Of course, unfortunately, there is no uh, imagery on ground level to be able to look up close, which is a shame. I mean, we can try quickly, if possible. As you can see, there's no circles. If there's no circles, then, yeah, the circle's down there, but that's further away. Uh, you got one of sun tunnels, I guess. Let's just do that one, as there's one of many. Let's take a look here, anyway. Yeah, it's a bit dodgy because of the thing. But, like, this is to put into perspective, right? you got people camping out near sun tunnels, literally, as you see on screen. A truck there, followed by another truck and a tent. So this is maybe something that was similar to the 27th or nearby, right? Um, just trying to understand that maybe the cars were parked up here... And then the people went on to walk. Uh, which direction is it? That direction, I think. That Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think over that way, that's Little Pigeon Mountain. It seems to be because you've got the tip, uh, the, like the highest point further back, and then lower down, it works its way down. Um, yeah, I'd say so. And then somewhere in between over that way is Dylan's Farm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, you look at this ground, okay? Um, It looks dry, but the ground still looks a little bit muddied, right? I mean, yeah, it's probably been used by other vehicles, so it's bound to, it's going to get a bit of traffic. But, like, even if it didn't rain that much... And you look here, and you see the wetness, right? Kind of puts into perspective that trucks can still get dirty. Like, look at that truck there. Look at the wheels. The wheel well. It's got dirt on it. It's got a bit of thick mud, right? So, the same could have happened on the on the day when Dylan's truck was used. Don't mean to say it, it went through a wash, right? Um, anything else to highlight? Yes. Look there. We've got another shotgun shell. Or some kind of shell casing. Now, I know people have said, well, it's hunters 
You know, that's just what happens out there. Yeah, I know. But interesting how it's somewhat close to Dylan's farm and close to the grain shed. It's in between them, right? Um, Previously, I don't know where it was now. It might have been, I think it might have been in Montello, but, or maybe it might have been more east of Lucin, but we did actually come across a certain zone where kind of like on a mountain, not quite, or maybe more on a hill, looking down at the valley, and there were several bullet casings all about, so it must have been a point where hunters gather and then just wait for animals to pass by, but with this being at near to Sun Tunnels, like, this is like a tourist place where maybe you take your kids, uh, you take photos, and then you got, like, guns being fired very nearby. Could that be a bit dodgy? Hmm? Is this the correct place to be shooting? Like, I know... I know, I know they aren't bullet holes, okay? Way too big. I know Maria said she's an expert when it comes to holes, and supposedly I'm an expert when it comes to looking into holes. Mm. But yeah, I can, yeah. They're definitely not bullet holes, okay? Is there any more shell casings nearby or not? Take in mind. This imagery isn't relevant to the date Dylan went missing, but I just wanted to look at the area, right? Because it's even better when you can be on ground level. It was very muddy there. You see lots of footprints. Considering there's only a couple of people there present at the time, those prints do remain, right? But you can still see how dry it is because it's all cracked, drought, and yet it's also moist or slightly moist because it is sand as well, isn't it? Yeah. You got these like little lumps and mounds. Hmm. Let me know if you've noticed anything in this area. Unfortunately. The view is obscured from Dylan's farm, from the looks of it. I mean, maybe it's passed on the other side of that bloody uh, concrete block. That's a shame, that. Can we get a different angle? No, we can't really. Well, that one's in front, isn't it? What? Here it is. Oh, some other people there parked up, just visiting from the looks of it. Can we actually see the farm on the grain shed? Something tells me it's probably down there. I can see like a black thing in the distance ground level, but further, further ahead. Yeah, interesting. Is there anything else? Nothing over that way. That's away from the farm. That's to west. Where's that road, though? Can't zoom in anymore, that's unfortunate. And then looking over that way, although it doesn't quite join up. There's someone in there. There's a fair few people there though, isn't there? And a quad bite too. Some stuff in the distance as well. Hmm. But yeah, you get the idea. And we don't have to directly apply it just here, but further away and closer to the farm. You see how flat the ground is in the terrain, but you look all the way around and you can see stuff in the distance, right? I guess the only other question I have is those hikers, the campers out there, you know, you, you take your own equipment, right? You take your supplies. Did they bring any binoculars, binoculars with them or a telescope? Because if they did, they could have like zoomed in on uh, Dylan's farm and check what was actually going on. Like, I don't know. Leave your thoughts. So, like, under the situation, you had no idea who Dylan Rounds was. You didn't, you weren't really aware that there was a farm nearby to where you were hiking. It's the middle of the night. You go down to that mountain and you notice there's a tractor in the distance with its lights on in use. Would you be intrigued by that? Would you be suspicious? 
Would you go down? Would you just stand around and time how long it's in use for? Would it really mean anything to you? Just leave your thoughts. I mean, I guess if that's where you're camping for the night, you might just sit about and look into the distance whilst also here and there um, looking at the tractor in use because it's just to pass time. It's just watching things as things go by and stuff until you go to bed, right? Maybe that's the case, but mm, it's just making me think, you know, how would you react if you were the camper or one of the campers? What would you do? That's what I want to know, okay? So all in all, I'm not quite sure about the reception of this video if people will see it, hear it in time, but if anyone is watching right now, if you want to, feel free to like the video. But more importantly, try to share this video and spread it so more awareness can be spread about the Dylan Rounds case and more specifically about this event that went down on the 27th and the location revealed, right? Because I think it's a key point in the timeline it's literally right on the verge of whatever happened to Dylan. You know what I'm saying? And I know you could once again counter it and say, is it really Is it really the truth? Is it this or that? Well, first of all, it's the person that's reached out to Candice Cooley and has been involved in the search at some point and even doing like a, a, a typed up letter and sending it to Candice to retell their story. I mean, their account of what happened right? So I mean, it's quite important, okay? And it might fill in the timeline for some people as well uh, of additional events that took place. Of course, if you know of anything else, feel free to share it down below. But if it's a rumour or if you've heard it from somewhere, make sure to use the appropriate language so people don't get confused and treat it as if it's 100% a fact or it's just happened. You know what I'm saying? Just try and word it kind of correctly just so it helps other people, okay? So yeah, feel free to share this video. Um, the good thing though, this time was, this video was specifically more centered and focused around one thing and one thing only, which was this event that took place. That is why the map analysis videos help break down, you know, the stuff. Because what's happened with time, right? Whilst trying to get the balance of a video long enough so it provides people long enough to chat, talk about the case, allow people to come on in who may be late, coming back from somewhere. With that format, you've got to think of things to fill in in between throughout the whole video. And of course, relevant stuff. And it can be a bit difficult. But when a specific topic, you know, a specific event or theme can be looked at and can be covered in depth, and for it to be long enough so people can join and talk in between and observe what's going on. That's perfect. And finally, was able to reach that point once again. Because, of course, we've not done a true map analysis for some time, right? But there's been obvious reasons why. Because there's only so much you can actually look at, you know what I'm saying? Maybe the last time we truly looked at some kind of map analysis was of the wash from Grouse Creek, Grouse House Creek, or whatever you call it, Grouse House, coming down into Lucid and then checking the ground level of that on the street view too, of that highway as the wash went underneath it. You know that one? Make sure to check it out if you haven't watched it already. That was actually, yeah, I think that was the one titled to do with Ty Corbin, places of high probability where Dylan could be. That's the way Ty was talking, places of high probability. Now, speaking of Ty, Indiana said, I guess relaying the message that Ty is taking a break or something. Interesting. Where did you hear that from, Indiana? Is this to do with Starcasm TV? Because Starcasm TV said they're taking a break as well. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sure they said, yes, this is Ty, but in addition, it's a network of several women on the channel. That's what I couldn't quite understand. Like, not so much to do with the Dylan Rounds case, but 
it kind of encroaches onto it. What you've had is obviously with these different allegiances forming, but then these like subgroups. Um, oh, how how do you word it? I can't. I can't use it as a comparison because it's probably more of an insult. But do you know, like when you get the Me Too movement, right? How all people collect together, more to do with of a certain gender. That's what's happened in this case, but more to do with a certain channel and two people out there, the dark forces, right? Uh, and then like these these mothers have all got together because of how they've been treated by that individual with time and they've all shared their stories, right? Kind of like that. Um, I've understood that like network, how all these like different people have come together because of a certain cause, which just happens to time with the Dylan Rounds case. Yeah, I get that. But with the Starcasm TV channel being a network of all these independent people uploading onto the channel, I don't quite understand that because they all sound like the same person doing the, the impression and voice. And it was like one video though where the person was wearing overalls and a mask saying, I'm not gay, I'm not gay. That definitely sounded like Ty Corbin putting on a voice. He was recording, it sounded like Phyllis. Does it really matter? Not really. But what you see, of course, within the Dylan Rouse case, these people, and it will be for different reasons, of course, I guess in Starcasm TV way, was just being funny and being... I guess maybe unique and trying to spread a bit of lightheartedness, which is kind of positive. But the theme, what you do get is these different channels, they don't directly show their true identity, their face. I mean, some have, yeah, like Ty, Ty Corbin has on his own channel, uh, Lance Kelly has himself, but not everyone. And the ones that don't show the face or tease at showing it, but concealing it, it just makes you kind of question a bit. I know uh, the, there might be reasons behind it. And look, this is your thing. If you're from the US, very nearby or far, it doesn't matter. You can still be a target, right? Like, there's a current case going on, or there'll be some cases going on in the UK, here and there, left, right and centre. And, you know, cover it. Why don't you cover it, Raf? Why not? Well, this is the thing. If you've seen the extent of what can happen throughout these cases, what we've seen and covered, what you've experienced, such negative stuff happening, and that's happened, whether it be to me or to maybe some other people who aren't even from the country. Now just imagine what it would be like if you were in that country or in that area and covering the case. It may make you more of a target you might get attacked in more ways than others, right? Um, and people might come after you just down to the location. So it's not always that practical, right? If you cover it from afar, you can be called out for certain reasons, of course, but you cover it afar, it's smart. You can't be got to as easily, right? Of course, if you knew the full truth about something, you could be a target, a marked target regardless, and people might come after you if it's that important, right? But... People are less likely to focus on you and more likely to focus on people they can get a hold of easier, right? So once again, the, the concept of maybe covering this or covering that, it's more self-sabotage to one's own life or one's own channel. So it's not practical, okay? So we keep on doing what we're doing, okay? To put into perspective, um, I'll say in advance, if there aren't really any updates or... Things are kept on the down low about the case of Dylan, right? I still have videos to cover. Roughly about eight to nine other Dylan Rounds videos. And maybe about two to three more focused ones, right? So there is still stuff to look at, of course. But I'll just see how things play out with time. Because, you know, if things are resolved or cleared up, then maybe some things don't need to be talked about, right? Time will tell. As for that mm, no thanks video, which is like five hours long, is it worth listening to for five hours? I don't know. Like, which is the longest one I've listened to? I think it was, um, you know who over there, the Dark Force. I think it was like four hours, 50 minutes, four hours, 40 minutes. And 
I got some notes from it. Nothing like major, major. Like it was probably like within the first hour or two where there was things to make to make note of, but then the rest of it was just there wasn't really much to note down. But this is the thing, if you if you don't know that all the important stuff is talked about right at the beginning and then the remaining three, four hours are useless, you're going to be sat there waiting and waiting and anticipating something else to happen. And whilst you can skip ahead, it's like, what what happens if you miss out on anything at the time? That's what's a little bit fiddly. But leave your thoughts in the chat, okay? That video by mm, No Thanks, Doug, the five-hour one about Dylan, was it worth watching? when you watched it or was it a waste of time list it down below okay let me know because I noticed he did another video after that a few days after which was maybe two hours long or so and it was called Dylan Rounds Updates slash Idaho 4 case and for basically most part of the video if not all of it was about the Idaho 4 case I don't know when the Dylan Rounds discussion was brought in because there was nothing shown up on the screen, so I guess it might have just been briefly talked about maybe at the start of the video or so far in. I didn't see any timestamps, right? Let me know your thoughts about that. But what we'll say is, as an observation, okay, and a heads up to people maybe, when it comes to Doug, mm, no thanks. When he does his live streams to do with Dylan Rounds, if Candy Cooley is not there, that's when Doug ends up going off on a rant all over the place talking about all kinds of things right maybe losing focus maybe as people have described using that fair tactic of words I don't know calling people out insulting messing about but when Candice Cooley is ever present it's a bit more structured there's a bit more of a flow right it's not as messy a bit more arranged but that might be because I've been in the presence and influence of Candice Cooley maybe because there's more of a more of a flow, it's not as freestyle, it's more ask this question, ask this, suggest that and listen to her. Because you've got to sit back and listen. There's a break in between but when Candice Cooley isn't there it's just basically Doug talking, 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 talking and maybe it's a bit hard to follow at times. Let me know if you agree or not. Um, is there anything else to talk about? I mean some people have hinted at can't wait for the downfall of, I guess, certain drama to escalate again. Do I anticipate it? Not really, but it just doesn't surprise me. Whereas you've got these, like, connections forming and people assisting with one another. Yeah, for now. For now, until something goes downhill, you know. Um, like... If you've got Doug, he might have a mind of his own. He might know what he's doing. But then other people have said that Candice Cooley knows what she's doing. And that's why she's assisting with Doug. There could be a food chain, of course. Whilst one person thinks they're in control of the other, there is a person above them that's in control of them. That's one way of looking at it. Um, I don't ever mention it before. There's been talks, or it's been... Like really roughly worded, right? Very roughly worded that possibilities that there's YouTube channels out there that could get sued within this Dylan Rounds case. Can that happen? Maybe. Has it happened with the Idaho 4 case? Uh, I think there was talks about it or something, but I don't know if it was to do with YouTube channels. It might have been more to do with general public in real life saying some things or spreading some rumours, maybe on other forums or platforms maybe. Will it happen in the Dylan Rounds case? Well, as I said, if anything like that does happen, it'll most likely be after Dylan is found. You know, the most important things done, justice is served, and then you start getting the other justice, you start clearing up all the other loose ends, and that's where it could get into the legal route. That's where it could get quite uh, deep there, depending on the mindset of Candice Cooley and to the degree and extent of what some people have done in this case, right? Where it be to do with direct involvement, manipulation of the area, moving items, disrupting evidence, and documenting it at the same time, and slash or maybe just simply covering it online and spreading misinformation, but doing it in such a manipulative way, right? Because if people got very strict and said, anyone that talks about any misinformation should get 
in, uh, should be punished like any channel. And it's like, yeah, but there's many, many, many humans and even people closer to them that would have spread misinformation too, accidentally, right? Sometimes you can't help it. But I think it's more aimed at the people that are directly causing trouble in the case. But as I said, once again, and there'll be some people here and there, you know, like Mini Me, um, I think she was being serious as well, but when I said, um, oh, you can be dodgy, you can do what you want, or, you know, you can be a bit loose here, that wasn't, I don't think it was said towards her, I think it was more said towards Corinne, is it Corinne? Cor I don't know, shout out to Corinne with the uh, yellow-orange profile picture who's recently appeared on the channel in recent time, that's good of them, Corin something. I said to them, you can be as dodgy as you want or whatever. And then I think mini me cut in and said, I'm not a dodgy person. I'm here to solve the case. And it's like, okay, well, that's good. If you're here to solve the case, why has it unfortunately cropped up several times that people have called you out for being a troublemaker? I mean, that is a shame because um, um, from like how you've been in my channel you've not caused me any trouble so i appreciate that that's good of you uh mini me maybe it's friction maybe it's misunderstandings between other people who don't fully understand you maybe but really as the saying goes for really anyone in the case trying to solve it if anyone wants to solve the dylan rounds case most likely you will all have different methods but when all the arguments and, you know, complaining and whinging and whining takes place, is it more so because you feel threatened by someone else's presence solving the case? Or do you just simply feel very strongly opinionated that whoever else is trying to solve the case is doing it incorrectly and you feel that your methods are better and more correct over another person? And that's what causes the tension and friction. Which one is it? Uh, when you say it. on better notes why not you do what you need to do that person does what they need to do and just solve the case separately and then the ones that are directly causing trouble then they're the ones that need to be you know dealt with right very simple very simple and you know in a way you can like sit back and uh, laugh with all the chaos going on i mean if you knew that the main, main people in the case have it under control and know what's going on ahead and it's a positive direction that Dylan will be found and then all the other people on the outside just bickering on, I guess you can sit back and just laugh, right? Because the main stuff is going ahead and all these other people are just wasting time. You could word it like that. Um, because I don't know the full extent of this case. I, I don't know what to think, but... Um, all the, you know, talking going on, it's like, whoa. Um, I guess the only ironic thing is, I'm probably, I'm not really, but out of the few humans in this case, community, and maybe even the Kenny of each case, I am the youngest person present, okay? Ooh, dodgy, dodgy. <laughs> you know, I'm the youngest person present. And the ones causing the most trouble are ones in in the age range of maybe 30, 40, 50 years of age. And it's kind of like, oh, not exactly great, is it? But, you know, anyone can be a knobhead at any age, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what gender you are. You can be a knobhead, right? You can be a dickhead, whichever, right? That's, yeah, it happens, but it's just kind of ironic, right? Considering how we're... Uh, uh, younger people are arguably more degenerative, more uh, selfish, more me, 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 more entitled, you know. Um, but on this very small sample, right, it's not really focused on that. But yeah, let's just put all that aside. If you have just joined, if you're late to the party, tough shit, but you can rewind back to the beginning and hear all about it, okay? Let me know if you enjoyed the video, if you found it of use. List any more comments down below or additional points if you want. If you need any more map analysis story times with additional information or bullet points for me to read off or 
internalize, interpret myself, feel free to list it down below and we'll leave it there because as you can see, it's getting very dark around me. I'm sure I can hear something creeping in the background. I don't know if it's Bella V. Um, why would she be crawling around? I don't know. She doesn't want to be seen on camera. Maybe she hasn't got her makeup on. You know, if anyone sees it, probably like a witch appears out of nowhere. The witch's broomstick inserted the wrong way. That sounds a bit painful. If it's not Bellevue, could it be Stony? No, you wouldn't hear footsteps. You hear a rolling sound, rolling around. Yeah, Stony. It can't be Stony. Could it be Maria? 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 Is that you? Hmm. I'm sure I can hear like nails scraping against the wall. Huh. I guess uh, I'll take a look shortly. But yeah, if you enjoyed the video, uh, thanks for watching. Um, and I'll see you next time whenever that is. Goodbye and good night for now. Maria, come on, stop messing around. I can hear you. Yes, I know you're behind me. What are you doing? Are you trying to claw my back? You know, what are you trying to do?